Harrison Ford is without question one of the most bankable stars in the world. His 36 films have grossed close to $3 billion at the box office. The National Organization of Theater Owners has named him the star of the 20th century. The characters he's portrayed have been legendary. Han Solo, Indiana Jones, Jack Ryan, that's just to name a few. His latest film is K-19, The Widowmaker, and I'm very pleased to welcome Harrison Ford here to this table. Thank you. Welcome. K-19. Um, like a lot of uh, your choices, it's not predictable. <laughs> it really isn't. Can you tell me about and tell us about what drew you to it, why you decided to do it, where you, how you heard about it, what the work was like? Well, I got a, I got a script um, that, that seemed to be a template for um, a, 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 an unusual, unique um, story. Uh, I've never... Well, I've right. never seen, I've never, well, first of all, I've never seen an American film that tr tried to tell the story of another culture without an American character in it. Can you think of one? Yeah, no, 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 no. no. And, and, and without any um, an, a American editorial uh, point of view, either. So that was unique. The kind of character is, uh, it's, it, it's rare that I get an opportunity to play a character of this degree of complication. Um, Normally, a character uh, that that I would be given a, a, a shot at has got a whole built-in support system. He's nice enough. He's sympathetic enough. He's humorous enough. There's you know all kinds of of ways of ensuring the the acceptance of that character. Um, so the, the, uh, for for those two reasons alone, the uniqueness of the material, the uniqueness of the character. And the, the sort of pounding pulse of the story, I thought it was it was worth a shot. So you were sort of deliberately getting outside the expected. Was, uh, a absolutely, yeah. It was That's a, great. It it's was great that you would, that you would try that. It's great that you would do it. As far as I know, other than Han Solo, is this the first time you've ever played somebody who is not American? Han Solo. Well, Han Solo. <laughs> that's, that's, he's, he's a, he, I don't think Han Solo is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, was that scary at all? Was it uh, well, it didn't invigorating? Me, it didn't scare me uh, uh, at the time. I thought it was, uh, I thought, I, again, that was part of the, that was part of the interest, part of the challenge uh, of, the, of, the, of the character. Did you go to Russia? Yeah, I went to Russia. What two, was that? Like? Two times before uh, before we started shooting, and then we shot there for three weeks. Well, I went um, uh, first of all to meet the survivors of the real crew. This is a true story, by the way. Exactly. Yeah, it's based on a true story. I mean, there are some elements that have been uh, uh, um, dramatized, um, but we we went to meet the the survivors. Um, um, and I wanted to hear their stories, their individual uh, um, memories of the experience. And I found that very fruitful. We also, you know, frankly, were there to reassure them because then they didn't know what the hell we were doing. They didn't understand why an American movie company with this cowboy actor was wanted to do a, 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 a story about a holy uh, Russian story. Were they cooperative? Yeah, they were cooperative, but they were like, you know, a little concerned that they, they they didn't want to they didn't want to see Hogan's heroes, you know, they didn't want to see them uh, themselves portrayed uh, or portrayed as buffoons who had caused this thing to happen, and and also they didn't want the state, they didn't want you know, um, the Soviet Navy to be portrayed this way. And I suppose, and, and they had gotten co uh, hold of an early version of the script, which perhaps characterized unfairly some, some some drinking and other things like that that they didn't like. And I didn't like either, by the way, because I thought it it broke that Russian point of view. So th those are things that I I never had any intention of uh, of uh, of being the script, and Catherine didn't either. So. But one of the thing that, things that there were two very compelling things. First of all, was how much this meant to them. 
And just seeing these guys in their 70s and, and 80s. And, Were there and, some of the men that actually had yeah, been crew members? Absolutely. Well, it wasn't relatives. No, 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 no. It was the real Catherine guys. Catherine had, had interviewed some relative, the, re, the relatives of the, of the character that I played, the, of the, the widow of the character yeah. I played. But these were the guys who were the, the crewmen on the boat, officers and crew. <clears throat> One thing was that was imp that, that really f fueled me was what this meant to them emotionally, what they had been through, sure. and how it was an epiphanal moment in their lives. And the second thing was nobody had the same story. A, a, a submarine is, by virtue of its architecture, compartmentalized. Right. This guy works in the reactor department. This guy works in torpedoes, so on and so forth. None of them had the same story. And, that, and of course, when it was all over, after 40 years, they weren't allowed to sit around and jaw about it. They got dispersed to different military right. commands, right. And, and it was declared a secret. So it's like, it was like a game of telephone. I understand the pipes came from the, from the torpedoes. No, 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 no. Pipes came from reactor. In addition to... <clears throat> playing somebody who's not American and getting a little bit outside the envelope that's expected of you, you play a character here who is, and this is an understatement, not immediately sympathetic. Yeah. That's pretty gutsy. Um, it, you know, how'd you get to that? I it, mean, never, how, it never occurred to me that it, it did was. not occur to you that people might not like this guy? No, I, I thought it was necessary to the, to the whole thing dramatic construction of the piece that people not like this guy that that's that's the way it was built I could see that looking at it that was the the, the, the that that was the kit of tools that it came with of course and that was and that was that's interesting to me I think it's interesting too I think it's interesting and gutsy that you did it oh, I mean I think that's unusual for somebody in your position in this structure. I'm not in that position anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm 60 years old. I, it's enough of that position. You know, I've done that. I, 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 I do the same thing over and over again. Uh, it, 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 I get bored pissless. Good for I, you. I Good just want to do you. other things. Do you think you have or have had guiding you in the past a career strategy or do you just go by your gut? Do you no, go, go by, by instinct? I you go do. by instinct. And the only, the only guiding thought that I've had is never let them nail you down. Never... What do you mean by nail you down? Ca type you, you mean? Yeah, typecast you. Not just typecast you, but, but, but decide for themselves what you're interested in. I wanted... I always... You know, the whole point of this, of being an actor is uh, to have different kinds of experiences. Otherwise, it's just like a real job. I never wanted to have a real job. So, so I wanted to do different things. I wanted to... to um, what do you do about the fact that you know that people want you to do certain things, though? That they, that's what they pay their money to see you do. Um, you know, enough of them will... will uh, I, I, I guess I have the... The, the ego to believe that a sufficient number of them will be willing to um, go, along, uh, go along with something, see, uh, uh, see something different. Ridley Scott said that you were a master of laconic realism. And David Anson said that you have this wry, quiet, sardonic masculinity. David Halberstam wrote that better than anyone else, you play the ordinary person who pushed one degree too far will strike back. And that there's a resonance on screen between you and what we identify as, I think, the American character, let's say. We don't want to start a war, but you push us too far, we'll fight the war, and we'll probably win the war more often than not. Pakula said that you... you you represent a kind of decency, a, 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 a moral man in an immoral time. That's a lot of heady stuff to be said about you. Do you look for morality in the scripts? Do you, do you look for? First are you of all, aware of that? You know, let's look at, you know, the context here. These things are said in context of the characters that I've played and American film. 
which creates this kind of a character. That's true. That is the American leading man. That's, that's, that's the idea of, of American film. On the other hand, if I put anybody else in those roles, I will not get what you bring to those roles. These people are also talking about something that's in Harrison Ford mm -hmm. that we see on the screen. Mm -hmm. I know I saw it for years. I, I mean, you were one of the few guys that I never met, but I didn't know. Uh, you'd had a long career, I'd had a long career, but our paths never crossed for a long, long time. I was always aware of you in those pictures and aware of the fact that there was something different from the typical action hero. Mm -hmm. As good as Stallone is in his action pictures, as good as yeah. uh, you know Arnold Schwarzenegger is in his action pictures, it's a different kind of, 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 of presence that you bring. Well, you know, I... Th there are, there are um, aspects of personality that I now recognize to be typically Midwestern. There's a reticence that is part of my nature. There's a, um, uh, a, a tinge of anger that's a part of my nature. There is uh, uh, a certain um, uh, kind of work ethic, morality that that is just comes from where I come from. Yeah, you're from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. I'm from South Bend, ninety yeah. miles apart. Yeah, so that's I, I understand it very well. Yeah, and the rest of it is just um, is. Um, uh, a sort of um, style of of presentation, an, an aesthetic that, it, I, that it, I that I that I that I feel strongly. It's a kind of wanting things to be square and and lean and and built brick upon brick and stuff like that. Good, and, and because of this, um, I think this goes hand in hand. You were not one of these overnight success guys where <clears throat> one picture and suddenly the whole world is saying who is this guy yeah. it was a slow process and wasn't it was it in fact star wars that really was the fulcrum i know there was american no, graffiti sure, sure. There was, yeah. but, no, but it, it was, was star wars. wars it was star wars and when you first how, tell us about how star wars came about how did you end up doing star wars um i was uh it was um, Dean Tavalaris, uh, the designer, uh, the designer uh, who was working for Francis Coppola, had uh, uh, um, asked me to do him um, a favor, which was to install a, an elaborate doorway, which he had built in the studio mill in Francis's offices at, at, at Goldwyn Studio. This is as a carpenter, as, as, a, a, carpenter. as a legitimate carpenter. Yeah. yeah. He couldn't get anybody to, to, to do it the way he wanted it done. So I, I was a Finnish carpenter. I, I said, I'll, okay, Dean, I'll do it, but I'm only doing it at night when there's nobody there. I'm not going to be trying to, first of all, you, you know, people are walking through and everything. And, and I also didn't want to be, I, I knew these guys. I'd done American Graffiti. I'd done the conversation. Uh, oh, you, oh. Yeah, and I, and I, and Wasn't I, it kind of weird to be working as a carpenter for the guys that you did? That's why I said I'll work at night, you know. <laughs> so I came in and I worked at night, and I was I was working late one night when it became early morning, and in through the door walks uh, uh, Francis and uh, George Lucas, Fred Roos, and Richard Dreyfus to interview to do it for uh, George was using the offices to interview the for uh, for, for uh, this new movie he was going to. Now, he had already told all the agents of the people who had been in American Graffiti that he wasn't going to see anybody who was in American Graffiti. He was looking for new people. And in walks Dreyfus. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm very, very well. I'm staying there. My, my, you know, Carpenter my clothes. nail apron with my <laughs> hammer hanging on me. So we chatted, we said hello, and, uh, 
you know, all, uh, you know the famous story. I went into Columbia Pictures and, and I had a five minute interview on a three by five card filled out, blah, 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 thank you very much. And I walked out and waited for the elevator and I felt I had to go um, uh, to the bathroom, went into the bathroom. When I came out, the guy was saying, come on back, he wants to talk to you. I know if I'd gone down the elevator and walked out in the street, it wouldn't have been worth chasing me. And he, got, he says he wants to talk to you. I went back. He said, you want to be under contract? If Maybe if I hadn't been there on my knees building the door, building the door uh, I never would have got through that door again. <clears throat> but, um, but, and George never interviewed me. For the for for for, for um, Star Wars, what he did was ask um, uh, Fred Roos if Fred Roos would ask me to read the other actors that he was testing for the part. So you read with I them. read with three hundred people as Han Solo as as Han Solo, yeah. And they never said they never said we're you know there's a possibility you might be uh, up for this role. When did the moment come when somebody said, hey, you're Han Solo? I don't remember. I don't remember. But well, that, I got the job. That was a turning. When did you know you were okay, you were good? Was there, was there a turning point? I mean, was it, God, I hope I can do this. Jeez, I can, hope I can get through this. And then, wait a second, I think I can do this. And then, hey... I, I've found some kind of confidence here, and I can do it. Um, I don't. I don't remember any moment. I just remember that 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 through, throughout the process of of working, I developed not not and not not more confidence in myself, but more understanding of the material, more clarity about how to give um, um, particular expression to an idea, you and how to look for ideas, and how to find ideas in the material. Exactly. But you were not, you're not a method actor, you're not a schooled actor, you're not a guy who went to the American Academy or went to the actor studio. How did the technique accrue? Did you think about it a lot? Did it, did it come to you as you were working? Did you spend time? No, it came to me as I was working, and it came to me um, the more correct the method I used, the more ease I found in it. The more correctly I identified uh, the purpose of each moment on screen, the easier it was. I didn't try and do everything at once. I just tried to get this piece to sit nicely against that piece. And, and um, I think that, w that skill was developing as an actor as another skill, which is the skill of storytelling. storytelling yeah. And knowing, you know, was was developing as well. That's a big uh, concern of yours, I know, and you, you you talk about it a lot, and I, it's a good concern. I mean, it's you think of yourself essentially as a storyteller, isn't that correct? Yeah, and uh, uh, I, more particularly an assistant storyteller, uh, an assistant to the director. That's just uh, it helps it it, it demystifies the whole process for me in a way. Are there questions you ask yourself when you're working on a script or do you tr do you try to think about do you try to tell yourself the story first? Is there any technique that you can talk about or is it one of those things that it's you, different every, it's different every time it, and it has a lot to do with who I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, I I um, S sometimes um, um, I, I will ask questions uh, of the director, of the writer. Um, what, what's the reason for this? 
is is this is this uh, not a repetition of something that's gone before? You know, can we, if if we if we turn this slightly this way, won't it won't it give me another opportunity to add something to this character? It's it's so different, different. every time that I don't I haven't I haven't figured out a, a a way to to explain what the process is. Is there a role that you feel comes closest to who you are? Is there one role that you've played that you think, you know, that's that's closer to me than anything I've ever done before? You said at I Apocalypse you, Now, you said you made a statement that at the at that time that was as close to you. Uh, a statement similar to that. Am I correct? Uh, I I don't remember that. I I was just going to say I I haven't seen the film since we made it, but. But I, just seeing that clip of presumed innocent, yes, makes me think that that might be that's as close as anything. That's uh, really interesting to to how I really feel. That's interesting. Confused, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, conflicted, um, uh, with a with a strong sense of purpose and a lot of obstacles. <laughs> and uh, and with a bad haircut, <laughs> as you say, this is all about haircuts, right? <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, monster, monster hit. Um, talk about that for a minute and how that came about. Well, everyone knows that uh, that it was it was supposed to be Tom Selleck's. Again, my my dear friends, completely overlooking my availability. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and so uh, it was a very it it, it happened very quickly. Uh, uh, George called, called called up and said, I "Want you to meet this guy, Steven Spielberg?" And uh, um, I said, "About what?" He said, "About this movie I'm doing." So I said, "Well, you know, give me a script so I have something to talk to him about it." He sent the script over. I read the script, and I went over and met Steven. And um, that that was it. Um, that was it. Was it fun? Looked like a it fun was. A, it was more fun. Uh, <laughs> it was great, great fun. We we were uh, both of us. Uh, um, I think uh, well. Um, I think we served each other yeah. well. Um, you sure did. At the at the, at the time, and we really had a great time working together and the exchange of ideas was easy and fast and and um, we can tell that watching it it was fun um, how have you changed over the course of this wildly successful career you've had I mean what's different what's different about Harrison Ford now than if I'd have bumped into Harrison Ford 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Jeez, I don't know. You know, that's... Uh, Are you aware of any difference in yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm certainly uh, more assured. Uh, I might have been um, pretending to be assured then uh, I feel more comfortable in my skin. I feel um, um, a little smarter, a little um, more um, aware of my of myself and and um, how to behave. Have you ever felt like you live your life under a microscope? No, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Um, it uh, it completely changes uh, your life. The loss of anonymity is one of the most shattering experiences uh, that I've ever gone through, and it and it didn't happen all at once. As I say, it no. was additives. How do you keep? How, how do you keep it? How do you keep it from preventing you from living? I don't know. 
I don't know. Um, um, Do you just ignore it and say, okay, I'm going here. I don't care whether I, I get bothered or not. I'm going to go. Yeah, and you develop a way, you know, little strategies for mitigating uh, the effect it's going to have on you. There's a, there's a kind of purposeful stride eyes not, you know, in people's faces that, that, that will get you through most crowded places. But it, um, it changes your, the, 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 the options you have for behavior. It, and, and one of the things that's most disquieting about it is that um, um, for me is it, it drives my kids crazy. Uh -huh. wow. They can't, they have a really hard time being in public with me. Because yeah. they didn't, this is not their disease. Yeah. This is not their problem, right. but it completely, they haven't figured out how to deal with it uh, at all. I think I have, you know, I, 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 I can see, you know, what the, where I've, where I've enjoyed advantage and, and what it's cost me. And it's not the best deal in the world, but that's the way it came out. Yeah. I can live with it. But for them, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's wretched. Have you ever had some macho kid or some drunk decide that he wanted to <clears throat> get in a contest with Indiana Jones or somebody and punch some? Not once. Not once. Okay, that's. I think that's precisely what we're talking about that comes through in you. I would bet you money that it's happened to Schwarzenegger, that it's happened to Stallone, that it's happened to a lot of other people. There is something you project on screen that does not make guys want to contest you. I don't, I'm not going to ask you about it. I'm just saying it as a pronouncement because I, I've been around with you. I, I, I see what guys do with you, what cops do and what fire department guys do. Uh, you know, they want to shake your hand. It's not just the women. When a guy's a leading man like you are and a big star, and he's a male, it's usually the women. The guys are usually a little bit resentful. Okay, there was the one guy. Tell me about it. There was one guy. <laughs> I had parked on the on New York City street <laughs> in my own car, and I'm walking up to this uh, traffic enforcement guy, and he's writing a, a, a ticket, and he's a, and he's just finishing it up. And I did the the thing you always do. I said, "Hey, uh, hey!" And he looked up, and he saw me coming across the street, and he just put the final flourish on it, picked up the windshield wiper, put it there, dropped it down, turned around to me, and said, "Mosquito Coast." <laughs> God, so you got to watch what you do if they don't like it. You got to get a take. One of my favorite pictures of yours, because uh, it's got all of the great stuff that's romantic, and it's still an action picture of sorts. Is is was Witness, uh, and that's a, a picture that you were nominated for, right? Well deserved uh, too. Uh, just talk a little bit about how that came about. Is that did you had you worked with Weir before? Did you? No, I didn't know Peter. Um, uh, there were two people. Uh, there was uh, Ed Feldman. Yep. Who was one of the producers on of K Nine? Yep. Feature of my career, and there Jeff Katzenberg, who oh. was running Paramount at the time. Right. Katzenberg and Diller were yep. running Paramount, and they uh, gave me the shot at this picture. And there wasn't a director involved. I'd seen something of uh, the couple of pictures. Oh, I, of, oh, you were on it before there was a yeah, director. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, I think everybody else in town had turned it down, <laughs> uh, both yeah. actors and uh, and uh, directors. So I got involved. Peter got involved. But they they had some. I don't remember the reason for it. But we had about six weeks from the moment I first met to the time they wanted to start shooting. So by the time we got some uh, enough of a foundation between us, Peter decided he would go off and research the Amish side. And since my character didn't know anything about the Amish side, 
I would go off and research the police side. We'd come together, we'd share what we'd learned, we'd do some work on the script, and we'd go off and do it. That's a terrific movie. Everybody, I think it's everybody's favorite. Uh, one of the first things uh, I noticed in watching a lot of those films is how scared you play. And that you, that you play afraid the way I know I would be afraid if it really happened, which is not like a movie star. Um, there is no um, veil that you're kind of winking at the audience with that happens with a lot of movie stars who are supposed to be afraid. I know when I saw The Fugitive, I kept looking at it and saying, man, that guy is really scared. He's scared the way I would be, the way everybody I know, the way the next door neighbor would be scared. Well, that, that, that's something that I noticed in other, um, as an observer of, of other movies, that that was missing. Uh-huh. And I, so I went purposefully to look for it. And, I, and also, it's one of the reasons that I, I try to do um, the action uh, myself. Exactly. Is because it's, if it's on the back of somebody's face, uh, yeah. back of somebody's head, a uh, stuntman's head, you don't get a chance to see the, the, the fear, the connection. That Maybe that's one of the, these reasons that we talk about where all these, the cops and the firemen and everybody else, the, the, the men do not see you as a threat the way they do a lot of other leading men. That we, we feel like you're us. You, you, you're, you're us up there, yet you are a movie star. You're privileged. You're living in a privileged role. But you represent us in a way. At least that's the way, that's really the way. You, you and I have talked about this before. The, the, the thing that I think that, that you want to be able to provide people is, a, is an emotional continuity, a way of feeling emotionally involved in the story. Right. And, 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 and if you don't uh, give them an emotional representation of, where, of how you feel, if you don't emotionalize it, if you right. try and protect yourself. Right. But the camera, I mean, the whole point of, of, of the camera is that it sees more than, than you do in life of somebody else. Good. So somehow you, 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 you recognize the opportunity that's there to, 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 to give little glimpses through the armor. If the armor's completely gone, then it's like, that's scary too. That's not right Good. either. Good for you. Good but it's, but it's, but it's. I always thought that the the deal with the audience was that you were their emotional representative on screen, and that they had to, and especially as a leading man character, that was how they found their way through the story because that's the real language of film is emotion. The Jack Ryan series, hugely successful. The audience loved you, and you did a couple of them. They made a lot of money. You stopped. Why? Um, there were th there were things about the script for some of all fears, which is which we might as well mention right now has become hugely successful film, and by all accounts very well made. I haven't seen it. Yet. I haven't seen it. Um, there were things about it that I thought were absolute obstacles for me mm -hmm. that I couldn't that that I that I. I, I couldn't live with. It wasn't that you got tired of being Jack Ryan. It wasn't it was that you got tired. I was, t I was uh, you know, I would have done it again if I could find my way through it through comfortably. It. Right. I would have been happy to do it because because uh, it's a it's a very rich character, um, and uh, I would have I would have enjoyed it. But there were things I just couldn't live with. <clears throat> I don't think I'm invading sacred turf to say that you and Clancy had some... There was that. <laughs> there was, yeah, there was some sense that Cl Clancy felt that the screenplays were violating his books. Yeah. You guys felt... He also thought that... I was too old for the part. And um... and you guys felt that Clancy was bad-mouthing the films and shooting himself in the foot in a way, too, and being destructive with uh, the movies, right? Um, yeah, that's fair enough to say. And part of the problem was that he was upset about the changes from book to film, which yeah. is always a, 
a sore spot. I yeah. know. Sure. Uh, with the what were the reasons for most of the changes? Because they wouldn't work on film. Uh, to create a character that the audience uh, that 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 had um, a little bit more conflict. I think the main thing is that uh, that um, um, uh, Tom Clancy felt that that uh, that his Jack Ryan had no moral conflict. It was all straight ahead for him, uh -huh. and I wanted some some conflict to take advantage of the of the of the fact that that you know. Typing's one thing, and and you can control in a way uh, through typing uh, what what the audience uh, uh, is meant to be able to imagine. It's a personal experience. You do it. Yes. One person yeah. alone is imagining yeah. it, yeah. so they fix yeah. what doesn't work. Exactly. But when uh, but but I I thought it was more interesting and more appropriate to create a character that had uh, some. Some, well, for me, it was complication. For him, it was, I guess, clutter. You've always uh, existed somewhat, until recently, below the sort of gossipy, tabloid Hollywood radar, almost like a, an outsider. Um, was that, I'm sure that was by design. I mean, you've, you've kind of stayed away from the rat pack Hollywood syndrome, uh, living in Jackson Hole, living in New York, not having the things that you do publicized. You've not been well, a... Well, I've never, I've never had a, a, a publicist. I've never um, uh, uh, made myself available to the press, except when I had something to sell. They decided, they decided that they had something to sell that was different than what I wanted to sell, which was the story of the failure of my marriage. Right. And that's when it started. That's when they got an edge up. Right. And then everything was fair game to them. Right. But you, for example, we don't hear a lot about the fact that you are very, very active with Conservation International. Yeah, and this is something well, I never wanted to be a poster boy. I wanted to be a board member. I wanted to participate in the process of that organization. I right. wanted to help them um, um, financially. I wanted to, to, to participate. I wanted to, um, so, but I never, I, I, I held back um, uh, purposefully from becoming a poster boy for them or any other cause for that matter. Because I think it's so much, it, it, it's so much more important to hear these issues these arguments about whether what's the right thing to do, how should we do, how should we approach the problem? Uh, um, I'd much rather hear it from experts than to hear it from celebrities. I love hearing you say that. I mean, uh, th this kind of uh, bizarre marriage that exists between Hollywood and politics, which happens all the time because they need Hollywood for finances, and then sort of go through the dance of, well, tell us what you think is wrong with the world and the company, so that all of the Hollywood people are now suddenly political experts, whereas it, it takes a lifetime to be good in one thing, it's pretty hard to be good in more than one thing. And it's, it's interesting to hear you. Tell me about your earring, Harrison. How did this happen? What in God, <laughs> what, what, tell me what happened. What were you thinking? I, I went to no, go. No, I, I like it, I, and I think most people do, but how, I, I, I just know this. Tell me what happened. How did this happened. It was a birthday. It's it? very goofy. It's it makes no sense. It, it, I was I had lunch with Bradley with with uh, Ed Bradley and another friend of mine, Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. We're sitting there and having lunch. I, I had my Melissa was with me and uh, looking at these two guys and they're both got earrings. And I said, I've always wanted to have an earring. <laughs> Was that your birthday or something? Was it I don't know. I, 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 I might have been uh, uh, close to my birthday. I guess it was my birthday. My 55th birthday. Yeah, that's what I remember. Yeah. So she said, well, go get one. I said, no, oh, come on. She <laughs> said, yeah, go ahead. So we walked out the door of the restaurant down the street to some place on Lexington Avenue, the first place that uh, 
pierce the ears, and we said, do me. And they did. <laughs> and you sent a picture that said you put a hole in me, right? Did I? Yes. Oh. That's what I heard. I went home, and my kid, my son Malcolm, looked at me. And this is, uh, you know, five years ago. He was 10. And he said, is that real? And I said, yeah, it's real. He said, well, can I have one? <laughs> and I said, yeah, when you're 55, you can have one. <laughs> good, good answer. Speaking of uh, working outside the envelope, <clears throat> let's talk about Sabrina for a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I, <laughs> here, here's a thing where my recollection is that somebody called me up and said. Somebody. Yeah, the yeah. studio. First, somebody at the studio called me up and said, or it was Scott Rudin, I don't know. Somebody called me up and said, we're redoing Sabrina and we have Harrison Ford. And I said, that's like a sick joke. I said, you're going to do Sabrina and you have Harrison Ford? There's a little bit of sexual confusion going on here. Well, and I thought, well, wow, <laughs> this is kind of weird. And then I got a call from you and, uh, and... And we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other, even right. though, oddly, we had met once because I was a producer on Presumed Innocence. That's I right. was never That's on right. set. That's right. I, I was in a meeting once in a studio in the office with you, and I, de I had developed the screenplay, bought the book, turned it over to Alan Pakula, and he went off and made the picture. But we didn't know each other, but I was a huge Harrison Ford fan. And uh, that was one of the main reasons I ended up doing it. Now, we made a picture which... Well, I was a huge uh, Sidney Pollack uh, fan, and that's why I uh, uh, asked if they would approach you about it. Well, whatever it was, we got ourselves into trouble because we made this Boy, picture. did we? <laughs> <laughs> and I got whipped to death for remake. And I, by not the way, more the than first, I, not first, more than I. The I took first my phone blows. call I made was to Billy Wilder. Yeah, and I called and I said, Billy. They called and asked me to do this picture. What's your feeling about that? And he not only gave me the blessing, he was angry at Paramount. He was angry because they didn't pay him anything, basically. <laughs> but he said, well, come on over, let's talk about it. I went over and had lunch with him, and he read the script, and we talked about ideas and all of this stuff. But, boy, the world never forgave me for remaking it. I thought nor you me, were one nor me in that well, sort of I, picture. I, I really did. And I, I think it's a sweet little movie, and... It, it suffers badly because it gets compared all the time to a, a sort of an icon. And, but you know, it's a bizarre, bizarre uh, a, adventure for, for both of us. It and was great. It was, but I, I, I look at yeah. little pieces of I I like it. I do, I what like do it I too. know? I also I like made it. money on it, oddly enough, so it wasn't that unsuccessful. <laughs> Are you a bit of a prisoner of your own success in the sense that, I mean, would you want, would you be able to do a little movie? If Well, I think you and I both know the answer to that. I mean, we thought of Sabrina as a little movie, and and, and we got our asses kicked for it. Well, what but, I mean a little movie, I mean a movie for a little bit of money. I mean a small amount of money. A, a movie that... Or what? You, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what? the answer to that. <laughs> No, I mean, look, this is what I do for a yeah. living. This is This is what I do for a living. This is how I... I, uh, 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 you know, um, this is my work, and I've never had any confusion between my work and my life. My work pays for my life, and, you know, uh, uh, while I'm saying it, it sounds like bullshit to me. It is. It's not really, no, it's not I really that. I understand very well. But, but... I don't, um, I want to do, uh, um, you know, I was, when I was under contract to Columbia Pictures, they paid me $150 a week. Right. And I got all the respect that is, that comes along with paying somebody $150 a week. I only found that I was valued when I was valued. And that's the way this business is. Now, I can do a little picture, and and that's great. Or and 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 I can do it for a little money. 
or I can use that same time, that same block of, of time that's, that's, that's taken out of my life, away from my kids, away from uh, my family, away from the other things that really interest me, and I can say, okay, I'm gonna, I have a value, a, a monetary value that I put on that time. Because it's not going to be, for me, better work. It's not going to be, for me, more ambitious filmmaking. It's not going to be more of a challenge or more of an investment for me to do a little film. Because I get this, I have this, the same problem, same problems every time. I'm not, I'm not, uh, 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 it's not going to be easier for me. It's not going right. to be harder. It's, so it's, it's very hard for me to think of, of uh, why to do that. And I, I also think that, that the supposition, you know, the, 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 conceit that little movies are more ambitious, little movies are, are somehow more um, dignified uh, to be false. Okay. <laughs> Harrison Ford, somebody that you know and I know is one of the really good guys. Thanks for being with us.